destroyed because of this freak. I won't allow it. These babies just saved this lame fest party. What's going on? You are listening to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman, but I'm not alone as we spring into spring. And you know what? The weather's been kind of cooperating recently. I am joined by, of course, my good co-host in the lovely city of Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. Alex, the producer. Yeah, it has been an incredibly nice week here in Guelph. Although the last day or so has been kind of rainy, although... I did something astounding this week. As most often we do off the top of the show, we kind of talk about our weeks that have been what we've been up to. And just, you know, we are people too, not just, here's your review. We do have lives. So this week I decided to, you know what? I'm curious. How far could I push this chair of wheels before it eventually dies and strands me in the middle of nowhere? So I decided to drive across the entire city of Guelph as far as the mall. And as far as the university, uh, for those that don't know how wide Guelph is, it's probably about seven kilometers long. I was able to go there and back on a single charge on my battery and still have over 50% left. So in theory, Alex, I could drive to you almost. Well, in theory, we're 45 kilometers away. Oh, okay. (laughs) <laughs> I would have 5% left in my battery, but I could do you it. Would, God damn it. You would. Pr- <laughs> like it's and it's stuck. also, there's also downhill and uphill sections. Oh, right. The hills that screw me. If it was flat, I'd be fine. If it was flat or all downhill on the way to me. You'd probably be fine. That's kind of um, funny though. Eh? You could probably, you would get just outside of Bingaman's and just, you would, you, you would get to the outskirts of town and be like, help. <laughs> help. And, and I then need a cab. actually, on a very good day with a fully charged battery and maybe a backup battery or something or 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 you know a good wind draft to push you along you might be able to get to the rippers wouldn't that be funny though just to see how far i can push this thing because they the the one strip club was moved to that outskirts of town right there oh the, right the, by the starbucks that's right yes uh, that's how i find things starbucks um Yes, it's the Starbucks next next to the Star Fuck. No. <laughs> but yeah, so I did that uh, this week. Fantastic times. I am done my college course. I technically can graduate now. I, As of this recording, I don't have my marks yet. I'm expecting what, to get out of this course with what like if a 70. You fa- what if you failed it? <laughs> I, as of right now, I have a pass. If 50% okay. is a pass, I'm good. Usually um, it's 60 in, in, in college, right? I think I should be fine. I would fucking hope so. Not, if not, just, I'm only laughing because it's like, how much of a kick in the pants would that be? The last course you didn't pass. You know what? I would be so annoyed. Luckily, I have funding to take two more courses. So if I had to retake it, which I shouldn't, <laughs> you won't. It's grammar. Pass. It was just so irritating. And again, <laughs> nothing against the professor. I did learn a lot as time went on, but I had a couple weeks there where I was really, really sick. And the professor's like, okay, you know what? You can turn in your work a little bit later. You are a little bit fucked up right now. So don't worry about it, Mike. You're covered. Um, and yeah, she was fantastic. So I should have those marks in. Yeah. And then um, I started looking more into going to university in the fall of 2024 um it's looking really good i have a little bit of academic upgrading but i said to alex and pretty much everyone's like you should maybe take a semester off mike you've been going pretty hard since 2020 well uh, the last thing you want to do is is go that hard and then burn out and then go to a, a level of education that you've never experienced before yeah that 
is not going to be a little less forgiving than than the college level. Yeah. So like you don't want to go in there, spend your money, and then be like, why am I failing? And it's like not for lack of effort it's just burnout <laughs> yeah so i'm I'm gonna take a semester off i mean i'm still gonna be doing the podcast here with with alex so oh, you yeah. folks won't notice anything but yeah no. i'm just mike's tired the difference will be your tweets and your social media messages will, will be less of i'm tired and more of i'm having fun <laughs> yeah exactly uh and okay so today uh me blair and my friend Jordan, who goes to the Storm games with me, um, we went out and played Pokemon Go today. Uh, it was a it was a field kind of research day, and we're having a blast. Blair got the best catch of the day, which made me and Jordan extremely upset. We're like, "Fuck you!" But the thing that made this all worthwhile. So Blair has this thing where she can't since she had the same surgery as me. She doesn't like the taste of regular water. When you have the bariatric surgery, it changes taste buds. Things will taste different to you. So um, we're driving, and Blair goes, oh, man, water tastes like crap to me, and I don't know why. And I'm like, well, actually, Blair, I did, um, I did some research into this, and I know precisely why it, it happens. And she's like, really? You know why? I'm like, oh, it's because you're a pussy. <laughs> Okay. Oh, <laughs> well, Blair's like, to hell with you. And George's well, like, ah. Well, we should, st- <laughs> we should state, though, that she didn't have the same surgery. She had the full bypass, which does yeah. change things more and yeah. how your physiology re- reacts to things. Certain things will sit differently with how we eat it. But yeah, the water taste thing, that doesn't happen to most people that have what you and I had. Yeah. Um, so. but, but for her, yes, it probably did change how things are because, uh, it's so different the way she absorbs things now right so Mm -hmm. So, i can see that but she walked right into that oh yeah (laughs) like you pussy uh so that was a blast uh we had a very 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 fun day we have a community day we're gonna go out and play next saturday with me jordan and probably his dog and uh it's just gonna be a fun time so that has pretty much been my week i do have a review this week i've been immersed in the wwe universe post uh ufc acquisition we'll see how this affects dlc down the road um but yeah i'll be talking about that in my review alex what have you been up to and what reviews have you got coming up for us this week uh well for me what did i do this week i went and saw renfield is it good because i'm gonna go see it on wednesday so yes do i need the back out okay good (laughs) i'm not gonna spoil anything for you because you'll get a kick out of it you will get a kick out of it because of things that we recorded and did with the avgn Okay. A couple of years back. Not that he has anything to do with it, but because of some of the things and research we did, you'll get a kick out of it. And that's all I'll say. Um, I saw that with my brother. I took him as an early birthday present. Uh, his birthday's today as we record. So happy birthday, Andreas. Uh, he is 30. He's young. <laughs> he's, he's old now. He's old. I told him that his wife's going to divorce him because he's old. She's not 30 yet. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he's uh, he's enjoying it. We're literally like, you know how you know you're an adult when your your birthday's coming up and everybody's like, why don't we just combine a few birthdays and get the family together all at one time sometime in May and combine like my dad's birthday, his birthday, Mother's Day into one thing. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, and like, I'll give you, a, I'll take you to the movies early before your birthday. I'll give you your presents later. He's not going to listen to this, so I can tell you what I got him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he has, uh, how many amiibos? Let me check here. Actually, it's easier to tell you how many amiibos he doesn't have. Um, because he's missing 18 amiibos out of every single one of them. Yeah. So he's got like, I don't know, 100, 200 amiibos, whatever they are. Um, and I was able to track down one that he didn't have. So he's getting that. Um, and they're not cheap. Like I, I found, um, I found a Ganondorf, which is one of the ones he doesn't have. It's more common, brand new. And it's official, like a real one. Um, and that was like 50 bucks, you know? And I'm like, it was like $18 retail, but that's how much it is now. Right. Um, he's also missing Greninja, Jigglypuff, Mega Man gold edition, Pichu Pokemon trainer Boo. You wouldn't believe that Boo is selling for over a hundred bucks. Um, Mega Yarn Yoshi. That's the big one. 
Uh, mm -hmm. What else is here? Rover, Toon Link. The, the, he's missing two of the links because they're from earlier on, like in the releases, and they're out of print. But like then I look at the other ones he's missing, and it's like Mel Zeno, Monster Hunter Rise, Japanese only. Or he's the one he's missing that he wants is like seven to nine hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. It QB, uh, which is the box boy, that was a Japanese thing. It's just a little white cube with two dots for eyes, and it's like nine hundred bucks. Oh, I know the one you're talking about. Oh, from yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he's got everything else, like everything else. So I, I told him, like, he, he made a list on Amiibo Life or whatever of the figures he doesn't have. And I'm like, on that list, buy yourself nothing before your birthday and you'll get one. <laughs> because I'm like, I did not want him to find a deal on the one I got him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then buy it and I'd be like, I'll kill you. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Yeah, like, cause I, I'm not, I'm, yeah, no. So he's getting that. Uh, he's getting a couple little, like diabetic puddings and stuff and surprisingly one other little thing i'm throwing into into the present box with it which are the mcdonald's socks that they're selling right now mm -hmm. you know for like was it mcdonald's day charity or something mm -hmm. i'm like you're gonna get mcdonald's socks so like that's what he's getting socks and socks pudding and an amiibo because he's an adult <laughs> that's funny so there's that um we had, renfield was good uh i was planning to see some other movies just didn't work out uh played final fantasy 6 uh as far as review stuff um in this well in this show we'll have trinity trigger for me as well as um our type uh our type final three one of those really long titles <laughs> uh and then i've got a few other things in the works that are embargoed still um but yeah so it's sort of been a catch-up time when it came to watching stuff and then obviously you had to watch a bunch of movies and some of the stuff we've already talked about and some of the stuff will be coming up so it's been a productive week but not an overly exciting week all right then all right guys so we got a lot of stuff coming up for you here on the show as alex mentioned he has those two reviews in the can and i will be reviewing the latest edition of wwe from 2k games we'll be looking at wwe 2k 23 hard to believe this game series has been around for that long and surprise guys i thought guys, you were, were going to say a thousand years <laughs> it's what it feels like it really does like ever since the era of like no mercy on the n64 um yeah i've got a lot of thoughts on this one but i will say this right now i actually had a really really good time with this one so we will we'll be talking about all that and more right here on this week in geek.net i've been mike the birdman he's been alex the producer we're gonna throw things to one of alex's reviews right here and we'll be back guys right after this only on this week in geek.net <laughs> Our friends over at NIS America sent a review copy of R-Type Final 3 Evolved for PlayStation 5. Uh, this is a pre-release code provided free of charge, uh, and I had a chance to check out some of the previous releases that they've done um, in their R-Type and other, uh, other mixes and remasters and so on. This is by far the most ambitious that they've released, uh, mostly because... <sighs> I might be wrong here, but to my recollection, I think this is the first game I've played using Unreal Engine 5 or Unreal 5. And that is uh, quite apparent when you start it up. It, it is the flashiest looking uh, side-scrolling shooter I've ever seen as far as like the 3D elements and the, the lighting effects and everything. And I don't think they're doing anything uh, spectacular, you know, pushing the engine really far or anything. It's just a big noticeable jump in, in visual and perceptual quality over previous releases. And I'm like, oh, this is, it's pretty clear <laughs> that they use something special here. And I didn't realize till uh, looking it up because I'm like, something looks different. And it's kind of intangible. I can't really put my finger down on it, but it looks different. Uh, now, as far as anybody, you know, if you've played uh, R Type 3 or R Type Final, you know, before this is the, you know, to date best version of this title. Um, there was a bunch of uh, levels and stages created specifically for the PS5, uh, which is interesting. It, it has, uh, from memory here, at least, yeah, about 20 ish or so stages. Um, and now there's apparently 
going to be um, a, an update for this that allows VR support. I don't have PlayStation VR or VR 2, so I won't be able to test that. But it's not in it at launch, but it's stuff that they're adding to it. So this is something that's going to be evolving past its release date. Um, the uh, the graphics, everything appears to be running at 60 FPS. No problem there. 4K. I uh, didn't notice any aliasing or anything. Load times, pretty good. Not the best I've ever seen, but pretty darn good. Uh, it seems pretty well optimized. Audio is, is pretty standout. You can customize your difficulty. You can uh, do some uh, some accessibility options for things like UI sizes and whatnot. Uh, again, it's just a hodgepodge, nothing hugely major there. Now, as far as gameplay is concerned, it's still hard, no matter how you set it up. Uh, this is a one hit and you're dead game when you start over from either the beginning or a checkpoint. Uh, but the more you play with it, the more you do it over and over again, it's the kind of game where you'll learn the patterns and you'll get good, <laughs> for lack of a better term. I had a pretty good time with it. If you're a fan of our type, and if you're a fan of seeing where uh, where these shooters can go with new game engines and, and just new visuals and polish, it's worth picking up. Uh, I know that there's a, a retail and digital edition that's going to be out for it. Uh, depending on your part of the world, it's either coming out somewhere between the 25th and the 28th uh, of April. Uh, North America first, then Europe, and then um, where else is it coming? Uh, Australia and New Zealand is coming on the 28th, I believe. Uh, overall, fun game. Very hard. So don't don't expect that you're going to win right away, but it has just the right difficulty curve, I think, to keep you coming back. The Prime Minister of Sweden visited Washington today, and my tiny little nipples went to France. Gossip, rumors, panic in the streets. We're lucky. This Week in Geek... News. Hey guys, welcome back to This Week in Geek.net. I am, of course, Mike the Birdman. He's Alex, the producer, and it's time to break down some of the news here on the show that, well, it's been a few weeks since we've been back here in the studio, but we're only going to be covering a couple of stories just because, well, we both have lives. But the stories we did pick for you this week are kind of neat, exciting. One of them is very relevant to my interests. We're just going to start there because... Honestly, it's the first tab that's open on my iPad, and you're just going to have to deal with that. So our first story comes courtesy of SuperheroHype.com. Paramount's animated Transformers film will explore Cybertron's origins. The Autobots and Decepticons are finally returning to theaters this summer when Transformers Rise of the Beast premieres on June 9th. But beyond this, Paramount has even bigger plans for the franchise, including a new film from Toy Story 4 Helmer, Josh Cooley, that was originally announced back in 2020. It's been ages since the studio provided an, provided an update on the project. Project. However, a long, long-time Transformers producer, Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, says the movie is still happening, and he even shared a handful of plot details during a recent sit-down with Collider. Early reports suggest that Cooley's film would be a prequel that takes place on the Transformers' home planet of Cybertron, a location only briefly glimpsed in Paramount's live-action Transformers movies. According to D. Bonaventura, this is still the plan. Fans will also see how the Cybertronians split into two separate factions led by Optimus Prime and Megatron. In other words, a good chunk of the film will still will examine how these characters went from being allies to being mortal enemies. Quote, this is something we are trying to do, said uh, D. Bonaventure. We debated a lot about it in live action, and it just was financially impossible to do, which is the origin story of the young Megatron and young Optimus. If you know the origin, they started as friends, and over time, things devolved for them, so they ended up on two sides. So we're telling the young Optimus and young Megatron story. We are looking to tell the origin story of all Transformers, both what they were at the beginning of it, how they grow, and how they grow apart. Uh, he also teased how the film will trace the evolution of Cybertronian society in a manner to similar how the destruction of Krypton and DC Superman comics, with many of the planet's inhabitants questioning, quote, how their society has gotten um, stratified and how the common man doesn't have a voice and entirely that and that's what they want to have. As for the younger versions of Megatron and Optimus Prime, we won't be getting a traditional coming-of-age story, but we will see how the characters mature over time, which will take more than one film to explore. Quote, we're hoping there is there is enough emotional construct to that, and that would lead to a trilogy of it, uh, he added. Because personally, I think that's a natural trilogy. I do not always look... I'm not always looking to do mul multiple movies, but there's a natural trilogy around that relationship. So you're going to see Cybertron in a way you've never seen before that no one's ever seen before. We're doing it in animation. We're allowed to really go all out. If you tried to make this in live action, then it would probably be a billion dollar movie or something. 
uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp co-writers, Andrew Bearer and Gabriel Ferrari were also previously tasked with penning the script for Cooley's film. The movie's title is rumored to be Transformers, A New Generation. Several industry insides uh, ran with this title last December when announcing Universal's uh, Twister sequel that was uh, slated to hit theaters the same day, July 19th, 2024. Regardless, Paramount has yet to confirm if that is the actual name. This could actually be really interesting depending on how it's handled. Uh, it's going to depend on the art style more than anything. Yeah, like if it looks like the Bumblebee movie did in the beginning with more animation, I'm fine with that. If if that's how it looks, then that's how it looks. Or as long as it doesn't look like Transformers animated, Earth Spark, no. I don't know. I, like I would I'm almost not... prefer it to go back to a traditional 2D animated style. See, I'm okay if they want to do it in the more hyper realized I'm, 3D style. As I'm long just, as I'm just very afraid that it's going to be really janky frame rates. Yeah, like this is something you really got to put a really good animation studio behind it because as good as the story may be, if it looks goofy, people are going to tune out. And with something yeah. they're expecting to hold your attention for a trilogy of three movies, it's got to be done right. Now, I'm actually reading uh, the ID uh, comics run of Transformers, and I am genuinely surprised how really, really good it is. Um, and I'm just reading through... Right now, Megatron has been captured by Optimus. They're going back to Cybertron because Galvatron is raising an army to fight some creature that comes from the dead universe. Trust me, it makes sense in the comics. And I was like, there's some great dialogue between Megatron and Optimus. And I'll never forget this one panel. He's talking about how the Decepticon and Autobot Civil War began, how the war on Cybertron began. Basically, if you, your form decided your function and that's what you did. If you were a mining robot, guess what? That's your job and you will never deviate from it. Military Megatron, hardware and consumer goods. Yeah, and it's like Megatron didn't want that. So he looks at, he looks at Optimus, who at the time was on the side of the Autobot ruling council. And he says, you always say freedom is the right of all sent sentient beings. Then where the hell were you when my people were being enslaved and Optimus doesn't answer him because it shakes them. And I'm thinking, okay, if you can put that on screen with the right gravitas and the right people, it doesn't have to be Cullen. It doesn't have to be Welker. It, it would, would be, be nice if that's how it yeah, ends. It'd be nice. Cause they're, you know, getting up there in age. Yeah, like at least get Cullen for like maybe the last two films. But, you know, as long as you get a good Megatron. Hell, I would settle for David K if you want to bring back the like kind of Beast Wars guy. It, it would they be won't. If their voices change as they age. Yeah, like I'm totally fine with this. And if you get the right people writing the scripts, as much as if these guys who wrote Ant Man and the Wasp, cool. I want you to consult with the people from IDW from both their original continuity and the aligned continuity and talk to Simon Furman. I'm fine with it. Just make it good, accessible and, and show it, the depth of this lore and make it not look like my eyes are going to bleed when I watch them move in motion. Yeah. I like I don't want stuttering. I don't want choppy animation. I don't want like Japanese 25 years ago, Armada animation movement. Uh, that was what was holding me back from the other Netflix one. What was the one that they did the the Cybertron trilogy or something that was like yeah, the three movies? It, it got it, better as time went on because I actually the, really enjoy it. The movement looked like shit. Like yeah, the, like the the character like designs were, were great. Mm -hmm. The physical movement looked like like flash animation. Mm -hmm. You know what I you know what I mean? Like that that janky movement where there's not a smooth twenty four frames. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just hope they don't do that. <laughs> yeah, like, like I want it to look good. I want it to be welcoming people into the Transformers property, and I want it to be in a place where if people want to check out extra media, they can. But it don't make don't make it homework, and I don't need it to be a who's who of of like kind of cameos. You need Megatron, Optimus, and a few people well, you, you on either side. You need Alpha Trion at some point. Yeah. 
Yeah, because he'll be the um, one who helps Optimus. You need yeah. Starscream, Shockwave, Soundwave, and maybe a couple of the Seekers. You could probably add some now, of the other people. Uh, on the Autobot side, like, because Ryan Pax, was, I, you've read more, but wasn't yeah. he supposed to just be like a construction bot? Like He like was, work, he was a file bot? clerk. Yeah, yeah, he was a file clerk. So, like, you could have him be, like, fr- like friends with Ironhide and some of the other guys. That, you know, like, he wouldn't have been somebody who was on the, the line, like, doing fighting or anything at the beginning. It would be – he. you could make it so that he has contact with people who would eventually follow him. Yeah, like, if if I had to put my cast together or a bots who have to appear, I'm looking at my shelf right now, I would have Optimus, Ironhide, Jazz, Bumblebee – um, if they wanted to put a girl transformer in there, everyone's going to say RC. I'm going to say Windblade well, would be my one. pick. Yeah, or her. Yeah, like because like there's he, a he story to, there he, too. He has to have his girlfriend in there, right? Like, yeah, they, it's it's a decisive moment. Well, or and what you do is like the moment where he decides that he's going to be a freedom fighter or be a whatever. Mm-hmm. The origins there. You, you have to have a disaster happen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so I, if you're going to go with the Lord and you have like Alita one or somebody, somebody he cares about gets hurt or a bunch of people like in some sort of terrorist attack or something. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's where you introduce Wheeljack. Yeah. And you inter- like you introduce a couple of people and they're the ones that inspire him with their bravery to, yeah. to do what needs to be done. And then eventually, you know, we find out that they follow him eventually. Right. Yeah, like, but at, the, but at the beginning they're like that. Or you wanna you wanna throw in some you know grizzled people that he can like look up to, people you wouldn't cup. expect. I was gonna say you put in cup. You put in some of the people from like the from movie season, movie two, from season sorry season th- movie and three onward, right? Yeah, you some of the put new in editions. cup and Springer. Yeah, you could easily do that. Uh, you, and all you have to do with like Springer and all them, they're in a bar. He's, yeah. they're just like they're just the kind of assholes that hang out at a bar, and but like cups holding court telling yeah. stories that you know telling stories of when he was younger and he was one of the guys that and they could even do like flashbacks like you know when when he, uh rodimus goes into the matrix in the five faces of darkness which gives the largest lore dump in the entire show's history mm-hmm. in that in that like five minute segment where they show the history of the transformers right they could literally have it where cup was one of the people that watched the gladiatorial fights like, yeah, but then like, again, well, then again, no, he doesn't know the Quintessons, so he's he's from after them. Yeah, so like he, so he's th- so he could be from the f- first cyber, second Cybertronian War. Yeah, well, it gets weird because they talk about how you were created. There's four, there's fours, and then Cold Forged, and this is something me and JT should really talk yeah, about. But, but like, there's so much. Regardless, yeah. you could have him be like he's he's such an old timer that he knew some of the old timers. Yeah, like that, that, were, that, that were belled. 13s. Yeah. Like 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 he knows he knows rumors of of their original rebellions but doesn't know anything beyond that. And he mm-hmm. could be a guy who holds court and just tells, you know, interesting gravelly stories while they're sitting there eating energon <laughs> and you have Springer in the background playing pool as a pool hustler or something. Yeah, like there's just so much potential here. As much as Bumblebee was fantastic, it took us a long time to get a follow-up. Rise of the Beasts, we'll wait and see. I don't I'm, think it looks great. <laughs> there are parts of it I'm interested in. It's just it's weird that it takes place it's, in the 1990s. It's not the same team making it that made the last movie. Yeah, I know. That's what makes me a little nervous. The director of the last movie owned the special effects company that made the special effects. And they're not involved now. And that was the biggest plus of the last movie. Yeah, like I'm. It's it's looking a lot more Michael Bay ish again, which is what I, concerns me. I'm cautiously optimistic because I like the idea. Or I love the designs for Mirage and Air Razor and Rhinox. Yeah. If it keeps the tone and dialogue of the last movie, great. Then I can ignore a lot of other things. If it completely like hand waves away Bumblebee which I'm worried it might, mm-hmm. then we're in for trouble. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Because remember, I, I, we're still we're still waiting to figure out how Quintessa is going <laughs> to... Yeah. The Earth is Unicron, and Quintessa is a, is a shapeshifter that can turn into a human. Yeah. Thankfully, they put this in the prequel era, but 
we'll yeah. have to resolve those plot yeah points this this is like, i think this takes place almost 10 years after yeah i think probably. it takes place in the 90s at some uh point. i don't think john cena's back yeah no i i don't think so my guess is his, his character will get name dropped and that's about it and and the main like the girl from the last one is she gonna maybe be name dropped in it or how are they gonna work it out like i didn't yeah. see any returning cast members yeah no i, I have a feeling you might get a a a reference to what charlie's up to but or, or do they clear. or do they maybe call in like at the very end they show up i hope it's an easter egg that makes sense like if the, not like a plot the, point the, if it's 10 years later or nearly 10 years later it could follow up now that they're adults like they're yeah. doing something in the background you know what i mean like maybe they're helping keep them hidden yeah, or maybe Bumblebee goes to visit her at college or university or something. It, it, hell, it could even start out with Bumblebee is her car. Yeah. Just, so, just to, to hang out. We don't know yet, but again, cautiously optimistic about that movie. These movies are much more interesting. Yeah, I'm much more interested in this. Okay, so our last story this week is something that'll be of interest to you if you're a gamer. So according to CNN.com, that's right, they're reporting on this stuff now. Sonic the Hedgehog meets Angry Birds. Sega is buying Rovo. So Sega, or Japan Sega, the company behind Sonic the Hedgehog, is buying R Rovio Entertainment in a cash deal that values the creator of Angry Birds at around $774 million. The Finnish video game developers uh, board has unanimously backed the takeover offer, which is uh, already supported by shareholders owning 49.1% of the company's stock, uh, Rovio said in a statement uh, last Monday. The company's shares surged 18% to uh, $10.05 uh, per share in Helsinki. Sega Samming Sega Sammy Holdings has offered uh, $10.15 per share, representing a 19% premium to Rovio's closing price on Friday. So this last Friday. Uh, the stock has gained more than 50% this year amid speculation of a deal after Israeli blacked Playtika Holdings, a mobile game company offered to buy Rovio in January. The company's prime asset, Angry Birds, which launched in 2009, became the first mobile game series to reach 1 billion downloads, a according to the Guinness Book of World Records. The story-based puzzle video game has players launching angry birds from a slingshot at a fortress containing pigs who stole their eggs. The game has evolved into a successful franchise, animations, merchandise, and theme parks. Uh, Alessandre well, and, and don't forget the movie. Like, and the movie, yep. I think there was a TV series too, but I'm not sure. Yeah, um, like, and, and uh, before you continue on there, yes. I feel that valuation is lower now because interest has rolled off of the franchise. Yeah, for sure. If you had, if you had, if they had been willing to sell right before the movie came out, this would have been a multi-billion-dollar oh, yeah. deal. Oh, but remember, yeah. the movie didn't do as well as people thought, and then the, mm -hmm. the subsequent games have not sold as much either. So, uh, uh, Alexandre Peltier Normand, uh, the CEO of Rovio, said he grew up playing Sonic the Hedgehog. And he predicted, quote, an incredibly exciting future in combining the strengths of the video game makers. The acquisition is part of Sega's five-year strategy to invest up to $1.9 billion with a focus on growing its mobile game business. Quote, among the rapidly growing global gaming market, the, mo the mobile gaming market has especially high potential and has been Sega's long-term goal to accelerate expansion in this field, said Haruki Satomi, the CEO of Sega Sammy Holdings. The company's share price closed 4.2% down in Tokyo on Monday. Quote, a shared fascination with animals doesn't guarantee future success, said Russ Mound, a investment director at UK online broker AJ Bell. Quote, Sega might be able to further milk Rovio's existing uh, intellectual property, but very few titles can be regurgitated into successful new games and spin-off activities such as films, merchandise, uh, ad infinium, he said in a statement. Um, Basically, they've run out of ideas of ever making anything new as far as a company, but mm -hmm. they have a strong brand with the one property mm -hmm. and they have a very strong infrastructure. Yeah. Like for me, like I'm a mobile gamer now, but I only play one game. Um, I'm trying to think what you can really do with this because angry birds. Yes. It still has a very active kind of player base, but it's not candy crush, which is still huge. It's can, not Pokemon Go, which yeah. has had problems in its communities. If you've been following that of late, and, and you can't monetize it to hell the way the Chinese games can be done because people will get very mad. 
Yeah, and very few mobile games have, like, a lot of m- games like that stay in relative, I guess, in its position in the marketplace because of whales, people who spend a lot of money on this. Yeah. Now, I spend not an insignificant amount on Pokemon Go, but always within reason. But there are people who created entire YouTube channels around games like clash of clans and pokemon go you're not going to be able to monetize angry birds in the same sense no it's i don't think it has anything to do with monetizing angry birds angry birds they've already delisted the original game that had no microtransactions Mm -hmm. just to make a new version that does and people aren't going to play it the same way and people are mad it's not about that and it's not even about using angry birds in sega properties Mm -hmm. it's about them being the people that develop all of Sega's mobile games with their yeah. own properties from now on. See, because they have the infrastructure. They have uh, 15 years of being one of the top like server infrastructure mobile uh, devs out there that know how to handle it, know how to make stuff. Sega's not good at that. Uh, what they can do is also, they can the first thing that they can do is have Sonic as a guest character in Angry Birds where... And it makes sense. He's in like his little kind of spin ball thing. Yes. He spins up when you pull him back and he fires off and goes, got to go fast or whatever. and just smashes into things. And his power up, his special power, if you want to pay a dollar for a special power up, turns him into supersonic. Yeah. Uh, He's supersonic. And like he bounces for an extra couple seconds or something. Yeah. You might see some Angry Birds pop up, you know, in like Monkey Ball or something. But uh, it's, it's really not about them owning Angry Birds even. It's about them not having to build a mobile company from scratch. Mm-hmm. I mean, all right, let's wait and see what kind of happens out of this. Like I said, I suspect we'll see some kind of so, Sonic will cross over into Angry Birds very really? quickly. Oh yeah, we'll uh, see something not, by not E three in well, June. They'll talk about something. It hasn't closed yet, so oh, okay, they still have to get their regulators. I think it's going to be by the end, by next summer, or actually by Christmas time. You'll probably see Sonic show up in Angry Birds, mm-hmm. and then you might see something from Angry Birds cross media things. I don't know what. It's not a property that has legs anymore. It really isn't. Like they were very smart to sell because. Prior to prior to the news a week or two ago about them delisting the original game so that they could put a uh, you know the bad press for them to put out the new version with with monetization, uh, which pissed people off. Prior to that, in the last five years, no, not five years, the last three years, did you even think once of Angry Birds? I remember passing by a bargain bin sale of old Xbox one games and PS four games. And I remember seeing angry birds. I want to say it was the star Wars version. Maybe it was on like a three sixty bargain bin of shit, but that's the or, last or, time I saw the game a, proper. Or was that a DS? I don't think it ever had a main console release. It did. I remember it because I remember you could download it if you wanted it, but they oh. did have a console version and there was one for the three DS as well. But still like of all the that's new it. things they put out, since what the star Wars game, has there been anything in the last five years? I want to say there might be, but I'm not hundred percent sure. So like it's, it's just out of the public eye. When you want to talk about surviving on whales, the children don't play it anymore. Yep. People, the only thing it has going for it is people know what it is. Yeah. Like it has that brand recognition. So now that's I not insignificant. I, like yeah, you could I do something with that. I don't personally think they were worth the money they spent on them what they are like for the for the actual properties it's about their infrastructure and their team that's what sega wanted and if they if they think that angry birds is what's going to make them lots of money they're full of shit yeah it's 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 not there anymore that's like saying something like flappy bird was going to make you money yeah it's just it was a flash in the pan it was hot at the time but mobile gamers from what i understand and again being a very much of a kind of neophyte in this space they expect a lot from your games you can't just add dlc to a game you can't just keep adding microtransactions like you're not wwe supercard you're not not yeah not uh, our market battle anymore. for the grid yeah that stuff only works not even in india because they don't have the money to spend it only works in china 
yeah so like anything that 10 cent develops sure there might be a couple good games in there but even call of duty mobile it's got a weird microtransaction kind of strategy too and most people if you're playing a mobile game from what i understand it's mostly fortnite and why are you playing fortnite on a phone is my next question but people are good at it so why not yeah um, i mean we, we and it's not old. a matter of us it's not just a matter of us being old <laughs> either it's a matter of they're not going after gamers or you know i don't like saying that you know who is a gamer and who's not a gamer trying to they're, gatekeep they're, they're not going after the, tra- the yeah they're going after a different market of people that wouldn't play traditional games yeah like you're looking for that gamer in the casual yet is curious to do more with and their who, things and who you can be duped into spending hundreds of dollars a month. Yeah. Like with like Pokemon go to play that game casually, for example, you can do it. You're not going to get the best experience. And honestly, you'll probably lose interest in it rather fast unless you know the meta, which is something me and Blair, we know the meta really, really well. And the game has evolved for us over time to where we are spending money, but we're also getting what we want out of it. Think of what you will recently with the r- r- remote raid pass nerf. That's a different conversation. I, for a different day. I have a, I have a very hard stance on, I don't play a single mobile game that has any monetization. And it's so hard uh, to find that now. I am willing to pay up to $25 up front for a solid game and no more. Yeah. It, it's hard to find a good mobile game that just has that initial investment. And that's, that, that's, is well, what it is. The last Apps game will do that for you. I, and I'm not a game. And I purposely like we get offered mobile games to review. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not playing it. i will not review it because you're there to suck people's money. Uh, like a vacuum i don't do that it, especially when your game is like rated e for everyone and then it's got gambling in it mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or loot boxes and all that crap no but that's why it's very very rare that we review a mobile title the last one that i did was uh moonlighter which was a port from uh i think the switch and pc because that is a pay once play a full uh, rpg game yeah I, like I have no i have no problem doing that I, I know I, you I can buy simply... ports of like other games. Like I know you could get Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy, yeah, but, that's but they're fine. just ports. Yeah, and that's fine. And even if you make a new game for it and all that, that's good. I will play that. I will even review that. I will not. Uh, and and argument is like, oh, it's free up front. No, it's not. A free game is never a free game on there anymore. Yeah, like even in again, and I, I go back to this example because it's the one that I know the most. Pokemon can be played free to play but it limits your abilities and like basically you have to invest so much time into it to get up to where the premium players are. You can do it. You just have to play very, 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 very smart. My and, time is more valuable than that. In yeah, my mind. exactly. I, you yeah. know that like for you and Blair, it's a thing you do together and you get yeah. out and do it. So you can attach added value on, on a personal level to it. Yeah. I look at that and go, I'm in my thirties. My life is too short. <laughs> yeah yeah i don't like, I have no i have zero interest and, and at least that one is one that makes you go outside yeah and there's an active community like me and blair have made friends through it with sega sammy how do you build a community from a game that's solo sure it can be done via youtube and content creators but it won't pokemon angry, go angry has you go outside is, angry birds is a dead brand like yeah. it, it it is and Everybody that works at Rovio is laughing because they made their money. Yeah, like I'm wondering what you do with this IP unless you develop it into some kind of a multimedia property, be it they, a new animated show, maybe a new movie, maybe like a Netflix series. But there's series. nothing to it. Nobody wants to see that. Like it, it's it's nobody wanted to see the movie. Nobody wanted to see the cartoons. It, that's why Didn't they, they make they, two they, movies. No. I'm pretty sure they did. I think they all failed. I'm pulling it up right now because yeah. this is like Angry Birds was one of the weakest weakest franchises i can imagine to get anything it's just it was the craze of it came out at a time when people when smartphones were new yeah it came as a mobile game that was competently made like there were some really shitty mobile game ports for example like i used to buy a lot of games way back on the iphone 7 
So way back when I had Ports of Doom, I had Crash Team Racing, I had Earthworm Jim, I had Mega Man, I had all these titles, and they all played like shit. Whereas Angry Bird, pull your finger back on the touchscreen at a certain angle, launch, and hope for the best. And it was fun, and it was easy, it was accessible, and it was casual aimed. What you do with this property now, gamers demand more. And mobile games have to have a layer. There's a complexity to it. And everybody, unfortunately, now, we expect microtransactions. And I don't think you're wrong, Alex, when you say it's it's a dead IP. What do you do with it other than brand recognition? So the first movie came out in 2016, um, which was, I would almost argue, past its yes. prime. I'd say 2014 um, was peak. And it made... 352 million worldwide on a 73 million dollar budget which was deemed a success we're not considering how much the marketing was on it but that was like again peak interest or just past peak interest mm -hmm. uh angry birds 2 was 2019 three years later 65 million dollar budget worldwide 150 it made less than half Ouch. of what the first movie did so and now we're another four years on from that nobody cares yeah, like like it's going to take a major revitalization and the right creative vision to make it relevant again. You've got brand recognition, which is great, but how do you use that? And that's going to be the challenge they are going to face with this. So with that all being said, that's going to do it for this edition of the Nerd News Only on this geek.net. We're going to take a break where you're going to hear my amazing voice as I take you to center stage at the squared circle. I'm, of course, going to be talking about wrestling. I'm going to be talking about WWE 2K23 brought to you by 2K Games. And I got to say, it's been an experience. So we will be back. And uh, I'm doing the John Cena thing. You can't see me. I'll see you guys right after this. Right after this weekend. Right after. On. Whatever. I'm leaving. We'll be back right after this. Only on thisweekingeek.net. New champions are out there. Five, four, three, two, L -A -one, go. Oh, I'm gonna be the champion. Oh, I'm gonna be the champion. Champion this. Hey guys, this is Mike the Birdman here, and I'm here to talk about the latest version of the WWE wrestling games. I'm talking about WWE 2K23 coming to us from 2K and Visual Concepts. This is one of those games that I tend to get every year because I'm always looking to get back into wrestling. Some people say, oh, you should follow AEW. You should get back into WWE. It's really easy to get into now. And of course, WWE has been in the news recently with its merger with a kind of UFC and whatever Vince McMahon's doing with his mustache. It is what it is. It's an interesting time to be a wrestling fan. We've been we're spoiled for choice. What more can I say? And sometimes we want to live out those fan fantasies on the virtual screen. And I'm going to be reviewing WWE 2K23 on the PlayStation 5. A review code was provided to me. So I tend to focus most of my attention in the story modes of, of these games. I mean, there are things like My Faction. There's this thing that where you can simulate like a season of Raw on SmackDown and do like all the programming choices. This year's showcase mode is John Cena. Okay, great. All fantastic. All very, very, very serviceable. But if you want to hold my attention, it's going to be with the creator wrestler, the superstar, the, the CAW, the CAW. And this year, I decided to play the... Uh, there, th there are two story modes, which are both different. But the one that I played primarily was called My Legacy, where you play the... Uh, the um, niece or cousin or whoever of a fictional WWE superstar and it's up to you to come up through the ranks from main event and NXT to eventually making your own mark on the WWE universe. So the character that I created from Toronto, Ontario, Canada is Tessa or sorry is Fox Tessa Tomahawk Valentine and I was really surprised to hear the announcer say my thing. And I love creating the fake social thing there. Where you have to add your like social media handle. So I added at Tomahawk rocks and I spelled it, uh, R a W K E S. 
and my character is she's a goody goody and she kind of dresses like marty mcfly does in back to the future with like the puffy vest she has like torn jeans she has like a midriff um thing she has like a necklace uh these kind of Janine melnet sunglasses from ghostbusters and these giant pair of like kind of headphones and i'm a striker kind of like um i'm trying to think who would be like this maybe like a daniel bryan type but he was more of a technical person anyway i'm you're getting lost in the kind of details and you go through this mode and you can go through like different story paths that will affect do you get a boost here what happens if if like you make a certain decision here there are certain times though where you can't progress the way you want like for example uh you come across as the women uh to be a money in the bank tag team um thing and you have to attack somebody backstage you have to play dirty and i kept saying to to the computer no i don't want to win that way eventually you have to kind of half-ass it and you kind of do it anyway and that's the only thing i didn't like i didn't get all the choice that i wanted but i got pretty much what i wanted and so many of these wrestlers are new to me like yeah i know who tamina is i know who natalia is i know who dana brooke is who the hell is shotzi Who's this person who's clearly inspired by Katana from Mortal Kombat? And as cool as some of it is, I'm just a little overwhelmed by choice. And that's not a bad thing when you want to, like, program your own Raws and Smackdowns. And like I said, you can do that. You can choose, like, who to break up, who to form new, and just, it's neat. Um, One of the things that this year's game is some of the character models look amazing. And some of them... Not so much. And I seem to notice it a lot with the women. Some of the models look really, really great. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the wrestler, but she comes from Toronto because that just caught my attention. And her model looks pretty good. Whereas another model like, say, Carmella doesn't look as good, but Bianca Belair looks great. And I don't know. It just it looks funny. And my character model, for example, that you may have seen me post on so- social media... In cutscenes, she looks kind of weird. Yet in the in-game engine, she looks fantastic. She looks great. So, I don't, I, I don't know. And there were some things that I wish you could tweak a little bit more. Like when you create like your your like intros and your extras, like the moves you can take. Like I just wish there was some. I wish the entirety of WWE's music library was available to be imported. And this is just a minor gripe. I really wish I could play with um, Christian's theme, Just Close Your Eyes, or Black and Blue from SmackDown from way back when. So that's how long I've been out of wrestling as a majority, despite running a wrestling podcast for a while. I mean, overall, WWE 2K23, I found to be really accessible. And there's some great accessibility options where you can turn down how smart the computer is, how smart it is at doing reversals how much time you get out of games you can change button presses to holding the button so if you need to break out of a submission or a pin it's a lot easier now and i'm honestly having a lot of fun yes there's a lot of technical things if you want to make you do a kinshasa or like a fireman's carry or like a pump or whatever like all these wrestling terms you've probably heard but never knew how to do and of course kids don't try this shit at home because you'll break your neck But still, I actually had a lot of fun, and I was able to pull off a lot of these really cool aerial moves that I just couldn't in previous years because it just, the controls felt weird. Here, they feel easy to learn, difficult to master, and the created characters are a joy. What can I say? I have uh, President Biden versus Donald Trump versus Michael Myers. And I know someone has made Art the Clown from the Terrifier series, so I need I, I need to find that at some point. So there's a wonderful mer- menagerie of weirdness here, and that's sort of the fun of these games is creating and seeing what what the community does. I'm always thrilled. Now there is new DLC that has just come out for this game. I know that there are 
locker codes you can find online that unlock some additional stuff for my faction. So always be checking those so social media websites. You never know what's uh, going to pop up. I think there's stuff here that works with like uh, the WWE mobile game Supercard. So if you're into that sort of thing, there is something there for you as well. But overall, I had a fantastic time with this game. I was surprised how much the story mode sucked me in. And when the wrestling gets like really, really intense, when you're just throwing strike after strike after strike and you go for your charge finisher and their health and stamina completely deplete and you go for the pin and it's one, two, kick out at two and a half and then you drop kick them with like a, with like a signature move or whatever and then you pin them, that's drama. I am here for that. It was fantastic. So I really recommend WWE 2K23. This was a lot of fun. I hope you'll enjoy it the same way I did. Although I'm still asking myself, who the hell is Shotzi? Time in and time out. We put in the work. It's hard work. Right, but someone's got to do it. We're the warriors. Never give up. Not the EST. We'll see about that. Can't let them have all the fun. Oh, crazy. Don't mind if I do. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. And we are back here on thisweekingeek.net where I have been pinned and I can't kick out because I literally only have one leg. I'm sorry. It's it's humor that it heals. All right. So we are here. Back Wait, how do, the, how do they put a wheelchair on its back when it's an electric wheelchair? Because don't they, have to, don't they have to pin you while you're in your chair? Because that's your legs, technically. I would, wonder, I would wonder if there has to be a disabled wrestling league somewhere. I would think that'd be very interesting. Either way, <laughs> I'm so just spitballing. I'm just thinking, I'm like, I pay money to see that. And then I went, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> I mean, they've got like wheelchair hot. Actually, you know what's amazing? Okay, so before we get into the news this week, I was talking about how much I enjoy hockey and basketball and all this stuff and just all these sports that I really enjoy because evidently once you turn 40, that's your new thing. Um, and somebody asked me this week, he's like, hey, do you play sledge hockey? And I'm going to say, no, but I would be very curious to learn because that's the wheelchair hockey thing. But that's one where you have to get so low on the ground. And since I'm an amputee, it would be really hard to pull myself back up to my chair. But once, not you're that low, that, once you're that low, that becomes your new low point for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You live down here now. Um, but yeah, I was just. It felt kind of cool. Like, hey, you love hockey. Do you play sledge? Like, no, I don't, but I would like to. So we're going to talk about the strange and the unusual things that don't involve me playing sledge hockey this week. We're going to talk about, well, the weird news. And this story caught my attention only because this game has done some really bizarre things in the last couple of years. This story comes courtesy of Kotaku.com. The Red Cross challenged gamers not to commit war crimes. The International Committee of the Red Cross has partner up, partnered with a bunch of Twitch streamers to encourage gamers not to commit war crimes in shooters like Call of Duty. The The ICRC hopes, hopes that its event, Play by the Rules, will educate players on the statutes of actual war. The organization has even created its own Fortnite mode to help communicate what those rules are. Quote, every day people play games set in conflict zones right from their couch. But right now, armed conflicts are more prevalent than ever, the ICRC website said. And to people suffering from their effects, this conflict is not a game. It destroys lives and leaves communities devastated. Therefore, we're challenging you to play FPS by the real rules of war, to show everyone that even wars have rules which will protect humanity on battlefields in real life. As part of the event on the ICRC's official Twitch channel, streamers have played a number of games while adhering or attempting to adhere to the laws of conflict, including PUBG, Fortnite, Call of Duty Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, Escape from uh, Tarkov. In, in addition to play by the rules, the event ICRC created its own Fortnite mode that's designed to convey the rules of war in the context of competitive play. For those curious, the official rules uh, of the ICRC's play by the rule events, which have been streamed for the, the that account for video game mechanics are one, no thirsting, AKA don't shoot downed or unresponsive enemies. Fair enough. Two, no targeting nonviolent NPCs. Again, in certain games, 
pretty easy. No targeting civilian buildings. When you're calling in a kills, or when you're calling in a, a score streak on Call of Duty, more difficult than you might think. Use med kits on everyone. Now, totally doable because you can revive people in certain games, but you can't revive a downed enemy who's on the other team. You just don't have that option, at least from the Call of Duty experience. Yeah, I was going to say, that could easily be something somebody does for a game. It would be interesting. Yeah, so the story concludes by saying, this isn't the first time that the IC that the I, ICRC has urged players to think critical about the rules of war. Back in 2017, uh, they hosted a similar event in the Arma 3 DLC called Law of War. In Law of War, gamers put down their weapons and took on the role of, hu of humanitarian workers as they respond to people in crisis. Um, deactivate minds, speak with an investigative journalist. According to the blog post from Arma developer Bohemia Interactive, the DLC raised a, raised a total of 176 thousand in which it donated to the icrc now that is interesting if you had to play and i don't know how you would do this if you had to here's how i would set this up for example and i'm going to use call of duty Warzone as an example for this because it's got the biggest kind of map it's got the biggest kind of player base you have to protect un soldiers or humanitarian workers as they go into a conflict zone so you can still play an active combatant, but you also have to protect the humanitarian workers. Should you come across, say, a down soldier from the other team, you have the option to capture and peacefully make them a prisoner of war, or you give them a med kit and that gives you a one minute window. It's like they can heal themselves, they can't track you, and you can escape. And you so poison the med kit. Oh, wait, no, that's against what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that would be against that. But yeah, like I think there are ways to do it. Or if you're a player on the opposite, or if you're a player, you can pilot one of the vehicles in the game, like say a transport helicopter. Here's a zone, evacuate as many people as you can while defending yourself from enemy fire. And you play it kind of like a ground war mode. One person is the opposing force, one person is the UN or other vague government or or organization. You could actually make that a really interesting mode. So, so but, basically, don't do anything that Alex would think would be funny in the game. Yeah, like don't shoot down the hospital helicopter. Don't, don't fly in on a Red Cross helicopter, and then when you're over the enemy area that you're going to evacuate people, drop napalm on them. Yeah, uh, like don't, don't commit war crimes is right oh, there in the title. But Michael, but, it's the only way that I can do these things without, you know, being modern day Hitler. <laughs> Clearly, that's the, you're argue, evil. that's the argument people make, but it's, it's true that it would be interesting if more games did that, had options for that. Yeah, like, 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 you, like you could do it where you make a game mm -hmm. and then literally there's two different servers. You pr click a button to be on a server where uh, humanitarian modes are on or whatever, and if you do it wrong, you get penalized. Yeah, like, like there are tons of options for games like this to, if you want to teach a message about war. I think there are ways to do it and it has been done in the past and it's interesting to partner with Fortnite because I know it's one of the number one games in the world, but if you're having Dr. Peter Venkman fight alongside Gohan, it's going to carry a little less of an, an impact because let's not forget Fortnite's the same group where you could do the floss dance while Martin Luther King talked in the background. Like, cause that's, we covered this a couple years ago. See, that's my issue with it is it's the wrong platform it, for it. Okay. Weird old man question. Mm -hmm. Does Gen Z care? I think in a certain sense I do, because like I watch like, a, a lot of TikTok, and there like, are some very aware Gen Z children. I, I, However, no, I, I, I get, I get that part. Do the Gen Z kids that play this game care? That's another thing, too. Like, how do you engage this very specific segment of the population? Like, for example, to play by the rules, again, a game I've watched a lot competitively, Rainbow Six. I'd be very curious to see how they implemented these rules because there aren't there are non-violent NPCs, and those are the those are the terrorist hostages you have to rescue. 
So that, that that's just that built into the game. That's just cool. Ubisoft. If you're listening, because you haven't had a game come out in almost two years because of because yeah, of you, yeah. <laughs> because of how you're doing things and how you've had things done. If you're going back to the drawing board to think of how you can apply the Tom Clancy licenses, think of that. Yeah, Maybe, that would actually be really like come out, like like come out, Rainbow Six Extraction was a huge failure. Oh God, yeah. Uh, Siege is going strong. What almost what was it? Almost ten season, years in. I think I think we're at season eight right now. At we're getting least. close to ten years. When it comes time to make another Rainbow Six, why you could literally make it be like, hey, you could make. I, I was going to say make the Tarkov killer, but Tarkov is, is its own thing. It's it's on fire right now with the cheers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the idea of an uber realistic one, you know, like that's sort of what Rainbow Six started, right? But why don't you make one like Rainbow Six? I don't know. You call it like Rainbow Six um, Meds or something, and you're and you literally relief just, effort. Like like you you have guns and stuff, but the goal of each of the teams is literally you're Extract thrown people. you're thrown into uh, a battlefield, and teams on either side are for are like opposing medical teams, and your goal is to get. Uh, get the people out, and if you come across an enemy combatant who's dying or whatever, you can choose to help them. It might you might get something out of that or whatever. Intel, and it's literally not you trying to kill the other med team. It's you trying to get your own team. To, the idea is to whoever heals the most people fastest and gets them out of there, and then you have NPCs that are trying to kill you that you have to defend against. Okay, I just thought of something while like you were doing it. And I could propose two modes. I'd have to tweak the name on it. But I thought of an an old code that Liam taught me. Liam is my next door neighbor who is former kind of military. And I know there's an acronym of HVT, high value target. So what if you called it HVR, high value rescue? And I could pivot this to take your idea, Alex. You remember way back in the Cambridge Chronicle days when we played Shadowrun, right? Yeah. There was there was an element, and it also exists in Cyberpunk 2077, called Trauma Team and Dock Wagon. Yeah. Take your exact idea. There's people you need to rescue. You're highly you're, valued. You're, you're highly dropped trained. Into hot, you're dropped into hot zones to get people, to get, like, spies and, and like, your own, like, high-value people out of a prison or out yeah. of a, out of uh, a danger zone. Yeah, like this could be a really awesome so full game or can, even DLC. So you can shoot and stuff, but you're also probably dropped into zones with with people that are you know civilians. So you're yeah. not supposed to kill any of them, and it, maybe you have to make choices. Like a civilian is injured, do you save them? And yeah. if you do, you might get a certain amount of points, but you might lose time to save somebody else. But saving them might give they might decide to help you by giving you directions to go around something like there's things you can do with it uh and that hasn't ever been done before it's just everybody seems to make the boring shooty shooty yeah like if call of duty were to do something with this idea you Uh, would gain an entirely new player base (laughs) call of duty probably wouldn't but you know what if uh if sony is really gung-ho and trying to make multiplayer games again socom would be pretty good yeah socom hvt that SOCOM, could be awesome. So, SOCOM team that you have to coordinate with, your tight knit team, and literally like one person on the team has a machine gun. Everybody else is there for different reasons to try to. One person is like the guy who like checks for traps. One person is the guy. And all of you have basic medical training, but if only one of you is allowed to carry a rifle, yeah, then it takes on a whole new reason because you're not going to take down an enemy squad of soldiers with a and, sidearm. And you don't get to pick. It randomizes who in the party is that. So not you can't just always have one guy who's really good. Yeah, I like that. See, this could be cool. Ubisoft, Sony, if if you're listening, Activision, let's let's talk. Medal of Honor and Band of Brothers and 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 all this stuff. They're all looking for um, or Brothers in Arms. They're all looking for the next thing. This and could be a really cool experiment. Don't just try to be Call of Duty. Be yeah. your own thing. 100%. 100%. Uh, that, and that's why I don't play Rainbow Six Siege, but I understand why it's still popular. Because really, it's the only one that's like of mainstream games that are on all the consoles. Mm-hmm. Tarkov is different. And again, it's a disaster because of hacking and stuff. But 
out of all the mainstream game companies, Rainbow Six Siege is the only one that's different from Call of Duty. Yeah, like it's r- realistic, it's more tactical. You really got to think about what you're doing, and um, at least if you're into gun porn, I, I, I think according to, to Jonathan Ferguson from the Royal Armories, its weapons are mostly accurate. So it's got something to offer that a lot of the other properties don't traditionally do. So we're going to close out this week with a story because you know what, Alex? If I've come to learn anything in the last few years, we live in the Matrix and birds ain't real, but maybe they uh. are and they're watching. So this story comes courtesy of the WashingtonPost.com. So this is about as real uh, as you're possibly going to get. On a New Mexico college campus, there's a large field that many birds fly over. Lately, some of those birds have been dead. Mustafa Hussanalan, an engineering professor at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, is using drone technology to lift dead birds back into the sky. First, he stuffs an electric motor into the tax taxidermied bird then he tosses it in the air the bird soars for a few minutes appearing alive from a distance he is studying the way the bird drones move in flight in hopes that the findings can improve aviation tech quote we want to fly them and flap them similar to birds to understand the the physics now i can't really pronounce his last name again so i'm just going to say him for the sake of this article dr evil (laughs) doctor yeah dr weird in this case so according to the lessons might someday be uh relevance for the aviation industry uh he began his engineering studies in iran before moving to new mexico to pursue a phd he's always loved birds he was amazed by how they evolved to master flying and hoped to one day invent drones that could mimic flight patterns last spring he ordered a handful of ornithopters a small machine with mechanical wings that flap like those of birds and insects and placed wings feathers and beads from taxidermied birds or sorry head sorry uh from taxidermied birds isn't that like one of the old da vinci designs Kinda, yeah, yeah, exactly. So when he tossed them into the air from Storico, New Mexico's university field, they flew for a few minutes. He ho- he he said he spent about two hundred dollars on each bird and tested wings from pigeons, hummingbirds, and crows on a flapping simulator for their ability to endure stress and speed. Uh, he then settled on two types of motors to be placed inside the bird. One generates a flapping motion; the other helps the bird glide with with straight wings he said he has discovered that many birds are adept at flapping but birds with wings lower on their bodies such as an albatross flap less frequently and are are best for gliding by studying both scientists hope to enhance a aviation technology regardless of their flight mechs uh the drone's batteries allow them to fly between 10 and 20 minutes but Hassan said he's working on an but he's but he said he's working on energy saving tactics that will prolong flight times researchers are studying how the color of birds feathers affect how much energy they exert and how fast they can fly that could set a new industry standard for which colors aircraft and other vehicles should use Quote, there are certain color pattern that are most efficient for a car driving down the road, but that same color pattern is not very good for a plane flying or a bird flapping, said researcher Brendan Herkoff, a uh, PhD student at the New Mexico in- Institute of Mining and Tech. Scientists say the drones could offer environmental benefits drones that look like birds and someday could fly alongside migrating birds to learn their flight patterns and behavior though he said he's unsure whether other birds will notice the drones aren't alive or whether the hawks or eagles might try to attack them the drones might also better monitor birds and other animals in their habitats without spooking them as some large loud aircraft do today quote the other application is for this to understand how birds communicate with each other how they escape from predators he said these are all unknowns, but we can learn this through technology. Uh, engineers have previously used bird drones as a form of surveillance. During the Cold War, the CIA built built a bird-sized drone to try and spy on the Soviet Union. In 2018, China reportedly developed drones that appeared as doves to monitor citizen. An An ironic Gen Z devised conspiracy theory hypothesizes that the U.S. government has created birds to supervise... Um, Americans, sorry. Um, The scientist acknowledged that some might want to use his drones for surveillance once they're more advanced, but he hopes their most significant impact will come elsewhere. Quote, this can create a revolution in the aviation industry. Um, Um, Long story short, we just have to hope that Someone doesn't co-opt it? No, that birds don't eventually develop genetic memory 
and in, in a time when they evolve, they go, why did you display our corpses in the air? <laughs> why did you parade our dead? Like, okay, I can see what he's trying to do. And I like the, there's, sorry about that. There's a, that thing where he talks about color. That's interesting to me because you think about how much solar energy you're gathering. Maybe your heat affects how fast you can move because you're creating more drag because you're hotter. Right. So also your, your muscles will tire faster. Yeah. So um, a white car and a black car, which one's going to perform easier. I never thought of it like that. You also might, might, might want to consider that what he's doing is pointless because you could have just used an AI model to figure it out. Well, AI models are good and they are advanced now, but I think there's something to be gained from watching you, how feathers perform. I get what he's going for, but it's not true data. No, because he's lifting a corpse with motors. Yeah, like, not like real. I, I don't see insignia. what he's actually gleaning from it that he couldn't get from having a high speed camera hooked up to watching birds actually move and then taking that data, putting it into a computer and watching a simulation. Yeah. Like I like the idea. Like, I don't know if it's as baked as it should be. It you know sounds I mean? like, you know what I like? Okay. It sounds to me like this guy likes playing with dead animals. Okay. Because there are a million other ways he could have done this. Yeah. Like I said, this, this story caught my attention, obviously from the whole birds aren't real conspiracy theory but i don't know like i think there's some interesting here but i'd like to understand more of what i'm looking at because math is not something i, I speak well this um, this would have been a better designed program or better thing 25 years ago before we had computer models although <laughs> with him taught with like with with the article talking about drones being co-opted for surveillance if this technology that he's developing gets suitably advanced, oh, they will. This if they don't exist, they will exist. Just They'll wait till you see a taxidermied cat flying through the air. Well, <laughs> well, just imagine the panic that would happen if someone found one of these bird drones that was super advanced, and it, it just happened to crash, and people like what is in this? The if it landed in the West Virginia forests of their local militia. Yeah. They're like, they thought, uh, they thought the government was making robot birds to spy on them. Yeah. Like this could be, I mean, not to put on the tinfoil hat too much, but you're not wrong. Like this could stir up a lot of interesting questions. Like, like that's, that's why I'm saying it's point. This to me is a pointless thing other than like this guy has a fascination with dead birds. Yeah. It's, it's weird. And that's why we're definitely talking about it. So, um, although but again, if, my, my flying cat theory, how, if you, my a, cat theory. if you had a cat and then you taped like bat wings to its back, like fake bat wings that didn't flap. And then you, at nighttime, we're looking outside and you saw a drone <laughs> lifting a cat with wings flying around. What would happen? Like you'd have some people lose their minds. The best thing, the best drone thing I've ever seen is someone took one, one of those dollar store Grim Reapers and attached it to the bottom of a drone and was chasing people through a park with it. They were freaking <laughs> the fuck out of the Grim Reapers chasing them. Do, you do that shit in a very Catholic, very South American <laughs> country. And oh, the morta, <laughs> the death yeah. is coming. Um, th there's that. The other thing that would be really terrifying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said a cat. A cat would be one thing, but if you just if you had like a children's doll, and I, I mean like like one of the more realistic looking, like 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 a, oh god, uh, don't no stop stop no no, and you just had that thing fly through the air at night and darkness towards you. Yeah, if you put like. LED red eyes into it. Sure, let's go the extra mile in the, in not, the nightmare not, fuel. Oh, not LED eyes, but you put eyes in there that reflect light like a cat's eyes at nighttime. Oh, God. So you just look out your window and there's a silhouette of a baby flying through the air. <laughs> yeah, people are going to be wondering, A, what's in the water? How much did I smoke? And 
maybe I shouldn't have had that edible. So definitely terrifying or, possibilities. And, you, with and it has to have a Bluetooth speaker in it so that you can scream into it from a, a microphone somewhere else. And as it flies, it just goes. Rang. No, you don't do that to scare them. You do it to weird them out. You have that play baby shark. See, then people know it's fake. Yeah, but no, you have to get them lured in when they see the baby. And as you go screaming toward them, then weird them out. Well, oh, leave them confused. How, how did I miss this? A ba- like a dead baby pot belly pig. Because when baby? pigs fly. Oh, when pigs. There you go. I suppose you could do that. Hey, Alex, you've just solved the angry bird problem. Sell drones. I'm actually kind of surprised they haven't done that, actually. But but seriously, the drone of a flying cat or a baby would look terrifying. Or like, oh, man, I just thought of the coolest idea for a what? drone. Why, would, why, has, why has nobody done a beholder? Okay. You know how we were talking about Transformers earlier? Imagine a laser beak drone that looks like laser beak and flies. And that has, would be cool. And, and, and has a, a like a zooming scope on the top of its head. Yeah. And you have that you have that Bluetooth speaker you talked about. And it just plays sound clips from like sound waves saying operation destruction. You can play the transforming sound. It's I would buy have, that. Seriously, or, th- there's money has, bro. Or if you do a cat or dog when it's flying over, like a, a dead cat or dog that you've taxidermied or whatever, uh, you have to fill a hole in it with, like, dog shit. So oh, that when, it, fl- so that when stop, it flies over, stop. it drops the dog shit, and it goes splat when it hits the ground, and somebody's like, oh, my God, it is a, a flying dog or cat because it just took a giant dump. Gross. Anyway, I'm stopping you there. Um <laughs> We are done for this week. Um, Here's Alex again. I'm not even sure what he's... You're evil. Anyway, we will be back, guys, right here on ThisWeekInGeek.net with coming up in the next couple of weeks, a lot of stuff. We'll be back, guys, right after this, only on ThisWeekInGeek.net. Exceed Games sent a review copy of Trinity Trigger on the PlayStation 5. Now, this is a title I've been waiting for for quite some time. Uh, in fact, actually, the, the review key that I received uh, was a dual redemption and it included a PS4 version. For the sake of this review, I just played the PS5 version as I don't imagine there would be much of a difference based on graphical capabilities, the design of the game, other than the PS5 version, you know, playing at 4K, 60, at maybe a slightly smaller file size and slightly less load times. So for the sake of that, there wasn't any point in me doing too much extensive uh, research into both. But in playing the PS5 version, here is something I can say. For anybody that was watching uh, trailers and going, oh, this this has some pedigree behind it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's like a mana game. And it, yeah, it is. What it feels most like to me, and I did do a complete playthrough. Uh, the only thing that I didn't do were some of the post-game uh, dungeon content uh, and and like some of the hardest things because it require a lot more grinding than I was willing to do before this review came out. But I did do a 100% story playthrough. Uh, and I put in just shy of about 30-ish hours. Now, you can do more or less depending on uh, how fast you want to go through some of the dialogue uh everything is voice acted for the most part there is i would say about 80 percent of the game is voice acted and then there's only a little bits in here where you might have somebody's just being like ha hey, huh or making like sound effects when they're talking but for the most part again voice acted very competently um now some of the pedigree behind this is uh people that worked on this have worked on octopath traveler the xenoblade series trials of mana um uh, Secret of Mana. The, it, it's got that pedigree, but it's basically like, what if you mix Secret of Mana with Legend of Zelda and sprinkled in a dash of almost like the Tales storytelling, if that makes any sense. Like the Tales of series. It's got a little bit of everything. It feels like they took something right out of the late 90s and brought it out now uh the puzzles within the game are not so difficult that you'd have trouble figuring it out but they make use of uh interesting 
like world abilities that you gain as you play throughout you the whole point is you're going around trying to <clears throat> trying to stop a war from happening between deities and to do so you have little companions that you can have uh, turn into different types of weapons depending on shrines you go to so you might be backtracking a little bit here and there but you never feel like it's too much there's fast travel it's super fast at loading but the idea is like secret money you get a uh, a ring wheel with all the different weapons that you can equip and the difference here though is um your companions will be ai controlled but you can switch to them at any moment and each one of the players of your three players will eventually if you do everything get uh all the different weapon types and i'm not going to say which ones how many there are because that may spoil some of the story points for you but each weapon type has a different field ability in the maps that you go to in the world so some rocks will even have symbols on them of what type of weapon you use to destroy it other ones uh can be used to clear certain things there's puzzles related to using weapons in certain orders there's uh there's a fair bit here uh there are super strong enemies that you can find in most areas that you must be near end game to beat some of them and maybe even past end game to beat more uh, and they, they net you like really cool items and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are, I, uh, did I do every quest in the game? I did almost every quest, I think, or side quest. Uh, there's not too many. You're looking at, um, I think it's, is it about 80? Something like that. But they are usually very quick. And if it's like a fetch quest to go get certain things, once you get, for the most part, once you get the items, it will auto transport you to the person in whatever town it was in that you had to go to complete the mission. So you don't have to like manually backtrack or figure out what's going on. Uh, there are, it's, it's basically one major path to go through most areas. you end up like, it won't let you go into a spot you're not supposed to go to yet. It just physically won't. Uh, and you're always sort of moving from town to town and each, each area is sort of themed different, like ice area, fire area, poison area, swamp area. And that's what makes it feel very nineties like, but I had a really good time. This is going to be like a bit of a sleeper hit. I think it's one of the best action RPGs of this style that I've played in a very, very long time. Um, as far as music is concerned, it's some of the best at this level that I've, you know, as far as this level of production values that I've heard in a very long time. Voice acting, as I said, is top notch. Controls are tight and concise. It's not so simple that it's press X to win, but it's also not so difficult that you'll get frustrated. Uh, you're introduced to dodge mechanics, which are mostly essential, but when you get powerful enough, you may not need to do it every time. Uh, there's also uh, situations in which you'll have to uh, switch to your other party members to change their weapons that they're currently using because they won't automatically use the best weapon for the job when an AI, they use whatever weapon you've equipped them with. So if you're fighting a boss where you're like, hey, I'm not breaking down their shields, you'll have to switch to the other two members, switch their weapons to a weapon that breaks shields easier, let them uh, weaken the, the boss, and then you end up going in for the kill yourself. Now, a couple things you should note. There are no healing spells. There, There's nothing, there's no uh, cooldown attacks or combos or anything that can do. You can only have items to heal, uh, as well as shrines that you can, like a save shrine, some of them will have the ability to uh, heal you. The, what comes into play here, though, is you can only have certain items have a 10 item limit or a 20 item limit that never increases. So if you run out and you're on a boss, you run out. Uh, it's not hard to get them back. They're cheap to buy with the money you get in the game and you can equip uh, uh, augments and, and stuff to your weapons and craft augments that give you double or even triple sometimes the money. So that's not a problem. It is about uh, managing your health. Uh, for instance, I was fighting the boss of the game and I used every single, I had every item you can get in the game maxed out and I used every single healing item. And had I not killed the boss when I did, within two hits, I would have had a party wipe and I would have had to start over from the last save point. 
Uh, so I was super lucky <laughs> and I felt a good sense of accomplishment and I didn't feel like I was being punished. I felt like I had to learn the pattern. It's not too difficult. It's got that right good balance of difficulty that way. Uh, so if you like the 90s, you know, sort of RPGs like Secret of Mana, you like Legend of Zelda, you like Tales games, yeah, you, you like when these companies put together an effort. I honestly think that Trinity Trigger is probably one of the best action RPGs of the year. Those magnificent bastards! Color me kooky, but something very odd is going on around here. You're not allowed to talk anymore. Hey guys, welcome back to ThisWeekInGeek.net. Well, that last story certainly took a turn. Uh, welcome back. So yeah, guys, we have got uh, some stuff coming up here on the site. I know we sh we did record our interview and conversation about Prehysteria and Theodore Rex. We did that with Enrique Couto. That'll be out really soon if it's not out by the time. Actually, no, that should be coming out this week. I just have to edit that. Um, we also have our second part of our Star Trek Picard finale video, or not video, uh, podcast. Me, Aaron, and Alex will get together and record that probably this week. Um, we're also going to be talking about what else we got coming up. Oh, we have to talk about Mando's season finale or S secret series finale. And we should just kind of talk about the scorecard where everything kind of sits with star Wars. Marvel's got a new movie coming out. We got guardians of the galaxy volume three coming out in what else? Just a little over two weeks. Yeah, I think two weeks from now. Yeah, so we'll have to talk about that. It's been a really long time since I've watched all three Guardians movies, and now that it's intertwined with Thor-ish, um, I'm sure we'll have conversation and thoughts oh. about that. Also, did you notice from the trailers for it, uh, like mm -hmm. the first movie was like early to mid-70s music from the tape, and then it was like late 70s, early 80s before he gets abducted tape mm -hmm. in the second movie. And the third one, you know what song they're using for uh, the background music in the like in the trailer what is that space hogs in the meantime from 1994 1995 okay so i wonder if that was on his zune <laughs> that he got oh yeah uh, that's right because they do use that as like a plot device you're right so and and it's i think it's a remix version of the song because they slowed it down Mm -hmm. um sort of like what they did with that cover version in black widow of um of the nirvana song mm -hmm. uh so anyway uh it, when i when i heard that space hog song i'm like oh so like it, it, they they're jumping forward in musical taste is it supposed to represent that they're growing up or or whatever uh but i just found it interesting i'm like space hog i haven't heard one of their songs since like maybe one of the like big shiny tunes albums <laughs> yeah i was it's like this is a entire like, vibe here like, like the post it was post grunge early alternative rock like when alt rock and punk pop was getting big in the like mid to late 90s one hit wonder group I'm like why'd they pick a one hit wonder because all their other music has been like big huge hits i'm like you know what i'm not complaining <laughs> Yeah. So what else we got coming up uh, soon, Alex? I know. So we've got a Mando season finale. We still have to record our last of us uh, and sort of video game movie or, I, or I, sort of television adaptations. I know Ken and, wants in on that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, this. So, uh, we'll have to coordinate that for sure. Sometime in May, uh, obviously before we ramp up for the not E3 coverage at the beginning of June. <laughs> Discount uh, E3 just count e well summer game well, summer games fest and then whoever has their shit together for, for shows in the first two weeks of april or may sorry june uh but for may we've got that uh, as far as well we, we've got uh a future imperfect already recorded that mm -hmm. uh uh we're going to be talking about the next gen movies right yeah so that's coming this week Probably or next week. week yeah what one of those two uh, as far as Earth versus Soups, this week we have Valley of the Dragons, and uh, after that, The Mummy's Hand. So there's that already ready to come out. I'm not sure beyond what we already discussed what else you have uh, ready to go or what you want to talk about. I know that um, Loose Cannon should be returning beyond what we recorded with Enrique. It's just figuring now, out when, we, when your school's done and everything, figuring out what we can 
actually watch. Like we have plenty of things. I, I remember I already set up a bunch of packages of things for us to watch. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of Getting when do we together. feel comfortable to do it? Yeah. Yeah. And now that I'm out of school for the semester, my time has freed up considerably. And hockey's done. <laughs> and hockey's done for the season. So yeah, we should be able to do that because before I dive in the baseball that starts in May. Um so yeah, good times. So anyway, guys, yeah, we got a lot of stuff uh kind of cooking. I know uh we're starting to put together the scheduling for our power ranges set session that Alex is gonna be running using the Essence 20 system from Renegade Game Studios. I am putting together uh the Transformers thing. We're gonna record as our summer uh kind of specials to keep content coming out when we are not here. Uh we will be recording that sometime in June for release over the summer. And we'll probably just record some other stuff because I know JT and I want to record some comic book stuff. And now that I have actually time to read and digest what I'm looking at, I'm going to have a lot of interesting things because there's just a lot of stuff I've missed not by reading comics for so long. And now that comics are more accessible via Comixology and other apps that allow you to like download and watch them, I mean, digital comics come with like almost everything now i think so there's no reason to not be caught up on your favorite issues and maybe i'd love to talk some manga maybe i'll talk to ken and maybe there'll be like a sale on like amazon or something um so anyway guys we got a lot of cool stuff i'm looking forward to doing the summer of twig um it's gonna be great like i am honestly i feel really good about this it feels really nice to have everything done for a change and to not be drowning so Anyway, uh, yeah, we have games, movies, video games, books coming up next week. I can, I've got a D&D book that'll be uh, coming out next little bit. I've got stuff from the Dune role-playing game. I've got some board games I want to talk about from Gale Force 9. I got some new RPGs. I have a new uh, Lord of the Rings game that is using the 5th edition rules for Dungeons & Dragons. Just lots of good stuff, and I'm really excited to talk about it. So, um, So for This Week in Geek, we have been... Alex, the producer. I am Mike, the bird man saying you still can't convince me that birds aren't real. I'll catch you guys again next week, right here on this week in geek.net. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response, were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Thanks for listening to this episode of this week in geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at this week in geek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.